Hey there, Henrik. Yeah, I feel awful today. <laughs> Let me get this, um... No, I didn't... I didn't sleep most of last night. This is all I wrote. Um... <sighs> and, you know, this morning... Feels like there's... Someone's, like, gently burning my feet. If you can gently burn feet. And that there's, like, this pulling pain achy and like under all my skin sometimes when it's really bad it feels like acid under my skin but in this case it's like just like a slow burn and like everything's stuck it sucks and it's hard to breathe <laughs> because I have chest pain when I breathe not because there's anything wrong with my lungs or I have a virus or anything but because the intercostal muscles hurt so much um, so stretching them hurts this is the fibromyalgia life. It sucks. Yeah. Hmm. I hear ya. Oh no. A lot of the night it was because of... I was having like a lot of intrusive memories and stuff. PTSD also sucks. Well, it's nice to see you're already up here on the chair. Usually I'd have you start over there where I ask uh, my questions, but this is good. <laughs> I'm not messing with my hair a lot. Oh yeah, so I don't believe in white coats. They are, they carry a lot of germs, so it's not very realistic. But, um, this clinic requires them. They carry germs, they're really bad for you, so. And in real life, I don't work in clinics anymore because they fuck with my PTSD. So instead I work in people's homes via telehealth or in the jungle. I'm much more comfortable with like wilderness medicine. That's what my fellowship is in. So, yeah. <laughs> so to answer your question, yes. Um, things can happen like long term after, well, a lot of different viruses. Jeez, my hair is bothering me. Um, Guillain-Barre, for example, where you have gradual paralysis from your toes up. It can happen after a lot of different viruses. Um, I've treated that before. We gave, like, high-dose steroids in it, um, or, like, uh, not steroids. There are antibodies you can give, um, that help. I'd have to look it up, actually, because it's been a while since I've done hospital medicine. Um, I could do it again if I had to, but, uh, it's a little different taking care of hospitalized people versus taking care of people who are outside. Different needs, different problems, different specialties, basically. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing that can happen. My fibromyalgia actually started after a virus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, it was 2015, and I'd just come back from a trip, and I started feeling like I had the flu. And then that feeling never, ever went away. And every time something it's like right now, I have like a collar of pain right here where it feels like I'm all crushed down and stretched. It sucks. <laughs> yeah. I have a patient, actually, I have someone I take care of who they actually got long C... Well, they actually developed fibromyalgia-like symptoms following their COVID COVID vaccine, actually. No, no, people should get vaccinated. Most people should definitely get vaccinated. But this is why I believe vaccine companies should be allowed to be sued, because their job is so important. Oh yeah, and the United States, super corrupt. Vaccine companies can't be sued. Other companies can't. We're talking like giant corporations that have trillions of dollars, right? They should be allowed to be sued. Because <laughs> they need to be held to a higher standard. Like, I'm allowed to be sued, and I am much less likely to accidentally harm or kill somebody than they are, right? Their job is so important. They need to be held to a higher standard. Yeah. Um, so, a uh, lot of good vaccines out there. Really important to get vaccinated. Um, I got the Pfizer myself. But, uh, yeah, this person, and I actually can't remember which one this person got. I think it was, I if I had to guess, it was probably the, um, Moderna, but I'm not sure. That's one I don't like a lot. A lot of people I know had like weird, they were a little more uncomfortable afterwards. I like the Pfizer better. 
but yeah, so he developed like a post-viral, kind of like my post-viral fibromyalgia. He developed it after the vaccine, which is unfortunate. But that's super rare. I just tend to get those kind of rare patients because um, people come to me who've kind of fallen through the cracks. I take care of, I, I take on a very limited number of people. Yeah, that's healthcare.bygenfinelli.com, but uh, I do not have a lot of openings, so it's very unlikely that uh, you can get in. Um, I take care of people who've like fallen through the cracks and either they're not getting help because they can't afford it or, and, and their area is bad, their insurance is bad, um, or, you know, they've got like a lot of complex things where mental health is affecting their physical health, um, or like people they haven't been listened to or believed, which is kind of a big deal, um, or they're neuro atypical, neurodivergent, yeah. Yeah. I kind of live in the intersection between where mental and physical health work. Because that's where I live physically myself, right? Up last night with like PTSD things, memories and stuff like that. <laughs> this morning, having the physical pain and the physical consequences of fibromyalgia. Like that's, that's my life. And so I have a lot of sympathy for people who are also living there, you know? So it is a little bit like, like I'm, that's why I kind of am branded as like the rogue. I wasn't, like, I grew up being, like, a good kid, um, and then in the military, people started, like, branding as, like, a rebel, and I was like, I don't know that fighting for my soldiers makes me a rebel, or being angry because bad things happen to them makes me a rebel, but people started thinking I was a crazy person. <sighs> well, because I had hidden my health problems for a really long time until they broke down, and then people were like, where is this coming from? They didn't know there was, like, years of medical records, hospitalizations, and other things like that. So they, they even thought, like, what is happening? I even had someone accuse me of, like, suddenly making things up, which is hilarious. Because I had years and years of medical records, I'd been hiding so that I wouldn't interfere with the mission. Because I really wanted to deploy and be good at my mission. So, um, it wasn't like I was purposely hiding them. I was, like, I was getting better, and... So I was taking most of my care off post, and I wasn't bringing it up. I was just kind of keeping it, keeping it really private, my health problems. But, uh, sometimes that doesn't work out. So, that's why the rogue. But yeah, I mean, I've got the tank top on underneath here. I don't, I don't wear this kind of stuff normally. It's unhygienic. How many months has it been since you had the virus? Okay. Any headache, fever, chills, night sweats? Huh. Chest pain, difficulty breathing when you lie down, difficulty breathing when you're getting up, like walking around. Stairs. Okay. Well, obviously after long exercise, people pant, but I mean like where you can't get air. Okay. Um, any abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, black stools, green stools, bloody stools, grayish stools that float to the top of the toilet. Okay. Oh yeah, doctors love asking about poop, man. Um... <laughs> You're having the pain, fatigue, muscle weakness. Are you having any moments where like something drops out from under you or is it like generalized weakness? Okay. All right, no random jerking or anything of your body parts. You have full control over your bladder and your bowels. Okay, okay day. Um, let us take a look first in your eyes. March 7th, I'll be back in Paraguay. Okay, I'm gonna put a hand on your shoulder here. Here, I am just looking to see if there's like little red dots in your blood vessels. I'm looking at your optic nerve. I'm looking at your... I'm tracing blood vessels, bovia, macula, all that. Good job, Henrik. Over here, same thing. 
Yeah, I saw that. They collected your vitals out there in the front. Good for them. Um, let us... I'm gonna have you come to the other room, and we'll do the rest of our examination um, in there. Okay. And we'll take a look at the eye chart, okay? I wonder why the eye chart is giving me trouble. Huh. <laughs> oh, you already looked at the eye chart out there. Oh, okay. All right, not a problem then. Um, well, let me just go ahead and set up some things here on your account because I hadn't typed in some of the stuff that we had already um, talked about. So, I don't like, they didn't enter in the data real good here for the eye chart. I'm going to go ahead and get one for you. Okay. All right, so I'm going to have you look down at row, uh, how about row eight? Yeah, over here on the wall. Um, cover one eye and go ahead and read that for me. Great. All right, other side. Excellent. Well done. Cool beans. Ears. Yeah, Henrik, everything looked good in the eye. I'm really sorry you're experiencing that. Okay. How can you prevent things like that? So, I don't know. I haven't seen good data on it. But, I will say, my patients, and this is from a very tiny patient panel, because now that I'm in a very small patient panel, and I mostly do advocacy um, and other stuff in, like, in Paraguay, um, trying to bring people medicines and things like that that they don't have access to, because they have to get doctors, but a lot of people can't travel to get to the doctor. So I have to try to figure out how can we get them to the doctor, or how can I get them medicines they can afford, because even though the public healthcare system exists, it's so overwhelmed, it'll run out of medications. So, that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so, a lot of issues like that. Uh, yeah, so transportation is an issue. And so those are kind of things that I'll try to get people. Oh my gosh, my eye is super itchy, itchy suddenly. <laughs> that sucks because I can't touch that. <laughs> is there anything in my eye, do you see? No? Okay, we're good. Just a lot of hair. Yeah, it probably is just the hair. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, and I'll do like pain relief stuff, screening ultrasounds, set up health fairs and things like that. Try to hook people into healthcare. A lot of times that's already there or fill in blanks. I'm still fighting for my medical license there because I'm licensed in two states, the United States, Virginia and Texas. And Paraguay right now is like very anti-foreigner, um, kind of xenophobic actually. So they're like making it very difficult for outsiders to come transfer our medical licenses over, which is really frustrating. <laughs> right now the holdup is, and this is like obviously like a big lie, like problem. Right now the holdup is my diploma has the name Jen Veltizen on it, because that's my medical name. And my passport has Jennifer Marie Veltizen. And they don't like, well, Jennifer is on both, but they don't like the middle name Marie. Even though, if you Google, there's like no Jen Veltizens in the world. There's like one other person possibly who spells their name with an I instead of a Y. And I'm very easily Googleable because you can look at my face because I'm a public person. So, you know, you can go to healthcare.bygenvanilli.com, see my face, see my resume, see that I'm listed as Jen Veltizen, see my credentials. 
They apparently don't feel like using Google. Okay. Paraguay is wonderful. Paraguayans are fantastic. Bureaucrats in any country can suck my... Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a big not fan of corruption. And I'm a big not fan of fake rules being added on to good rules. I hate rules. I don't see a purpose for extra rules. And unless a rule is protecting someone from harming somebody else... Fuck it. Okay. Really fuck it. Um, and ideally, you know, and my middle name being Marie does not help protect anybody from anything when it's very clear who I am. My diploma says Jennifer Veldeisen. I'm Jennifer Veldeisen. There's no other Jennifer Veldeisen. And it's very frustrating. So, that's the fake hold up right now. And then my lawyer's slow. So much I'm complaining about. <laughs> I'm looking to see if you have any erythema, any edema, um, any bolting of your tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane looks pretty clear. You'd have some serum and build up here. I'm going to touch your ear here, Henrik, okay? Well, just... I'm taking the outside to make sure there's no, like, nothing that needs to be drained to prevent cauliflower ear or something like that, you know? I used to take care of a lot of combatants. <laughs> Over here, too. No, I was with a cavalry. Cavalry has done blinks place, places like in Vietnam and Iraq. They did a lot of stuff, but um, it's like tanks. But there's issues. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, I didn't put the attachment on. Um, I'm just gonna sanitize it. Yeah. Usually I put the attachment. You do have a little bit of scaling and redness in your ear. That's common with allergies. Just real quick. And I will put the attachment on for your nose. Where is my little attachment? Jeez. I spilled all my attachments out into my big black duct bag. It appears so. for here, Henrik, is if it's like, um, if we're having, like, swelling. Yeah. Right. And then just real quick, look at me. Yeah, just deep staring at my nose. Great. Obviously, I'm not just blessing you, Rona. <laughs> All right, tell me when you can see my hands. Rock on. Okay. Just enter some data here into your chart, my dear. Okay. I'm gonna feel your lymph nodes, your thyroid. Okay. My fingers are gonna be. I'm doing first, and I'm going over the front lymph nodes, the back lymph nodes along the sternocleidomastoid, here along the lymph nodes that are here, okay. And then there's some important lymph nodes for cancer things on your collarbone. Yeah. And just kind of in the back, too. Okay, here along the back here. Just here along here. Now, the thyroid exam a lot of times is done from the back. It can be done from the back or the front. I like to be able to see. Okay. Alright, Henry, go ahead and swallow. Okay. Good. Alright, let's go ahead and listen to your lungs. My good stuff is 
just going to put this in my earlobe bag. We're going to use this stethoscope. They say a good practitioner does not blame their tools. However, cardiologists like the other stethoscope. The Littman Cardiology 3. It's the same brand I've had since medical school. This is backwards. This is really frustrating me. This, like, this one is not as good. Why is it so... Over here, can you go ahead and say 99? Okay. 99. In here, 99. 99. Here, go ahead and say E. In here, E. 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 Excellent. Whisper something. And whisper. And here. And here. Okay. Alright, Henrik, go ahead and whisper here. And here. And here. And here. Excellent. Alright, here in the front. Take a deep breath in. So here I have both dudes and chicks kind of lift their breast if they have one so that it's easier for me to access. It's normal. It's better than me doing it for them. And then over here. Awesome. side under your arm, kind of like below your armpit, but like over here to the side, while you lie on your side. Yeah, it's called left lateral decubitus position. Okay. I'm gonna do it again. I'm gonna have you clench your fists, okay? And here. 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 And over here. Okay. to do there with those two exercises is 
I'm trying to change the preload and afterload of blood coming to your heart. Squeezing changes the afterload. In other words, squeezing here blocks some of the blood that's coming from the arteries. Like, it, it makes it harder for them to flow, right? Because you squeeze everything. Um, and so that can put pressure on certain parts of the heart and change murmur sounds, which can help us figure out what kind of murmurs there are and what's wrong. Um, and then preload is like your vein has returned, how much load the veins are carrying back. And bearing down puts pressure on your inferior vena cava and all the big stuff coming back from like your legs um, and kind of shoves it forward. <laughs> So you increase preload, and that puts pressure on different parts of the heart. So we can kind of figure stuff out that way. Yeah. I'm listening to your belly too, okay? You're doing great, Henrik. Gosh, I hate how this bends. Uh, yeah. And over here? Yeah, listen in four quadrants. Some people listen in nine, but I was taught to do four. Okay, I'm going to tap on your belly now. It's called percussion. I'm trying to listen to the sounds of different parts of your stomach. There, I'm trying to evaluate your ribs and figure out where your liver is relative to your li ribs, if it's enlarged like in an alcoholic. rest of your stomach. I'm just tapping because I want to hear. Are you bloated? Is there a lot of empty space? Does it sound like there's fluid? What's up? Yeah. I'm going to push down now. Okay, here. I'm going to stick my hand, finger kind of under your rib. Hold your breath for a second. Okay, take a deep breath. my finger in. Dinner. Okay, cool. I'm gonna squeeze back here. I'm capturing your spleen is what it's called. I'm just trying to see if your spleen is enlarged. I shouldn't be able to feel it if it's not. Mono can do that. Did you get tested for mono when you got tested for... Oh no, you got a positive COVID test. Okay, rock on. I mean, not rock on, that sucks, but you know, I know, what you, I know what's up. Bend this leg backwards a little bit, okay? I'm gonna tap on your foot. Yeah, that's part of the stomach exam. I'm trying to see if you have peritoneal signs. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Alright, I'm just gonna enter this into the computer over here. Behind you. Yeah, no murmurs. Breath sounds are normal. and when you can hear it. Okay, good. So there we got cranial nerves 7 and 8. So we got 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 
We got 9 and 10, we got 11 and 12. So 1 and 2, 2, we tested your vision earlier. 1 is actually smell. We really only use it. So there was a study that I had to learn for part of the, the Wilderness Medicine Society for my Fellowship of Advanced Wilderness Medicine. Um, there's a thing where you have to, uh, where they found that in high-performance athletes, you could use smell to predict uh, brain disease. Uh, not brain disease, but like brain damage from what they were doing, like dehydrating themselves, running really, really far in high altitude and so forth. Yeah. So that's more what it's used for. Um, if someone starts losing their sense of smell, like Parkinson's sometimes starts that way. Or does start that way. I mean, if you want, we can test smell. <laughs> Here. What's this smell like? You pass. <laughs> Alright, let's get your reflexes here. Yeah, not just the knee, we do a bunch of other things too. Okay, ready? I want you to tell me a story and look over there. Yes. Okay, here. Oh yeah, it doesn't have to kick really far, Henrik. That's totally fine. Okay, down here on your Achilles tendon. Again, I'd like you to look up at the ceiling and start telling me stuff. Any stuff. Like, how's your work going? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry you heard that. <laughs> well, that's good news at least. Alright, give me your arm like this. I'm gonna hit here and here. I'm testing here. I, well, I don't need to tell you what I'm testing because then you'll do it. And I don't want you to do it. So here on your biceps tendon. Okay, and over here. Over here, same. Okay. And then I'm gonna hold your arm up like this, okay? Better tap here. Alright. Yeah, that's your triceps tendon. Same thing on the other side. with those reflexes. I'm happy with that. Uh, that's all very good stuff. I think I have a monofilament tester. Let me double check. I may not. No, I mostly have needle decompression. Why do you ask? I'm fairly certain I did have one at one point in time. I have a sharpie. I can draw on you. <laughs> yeah. I think I know I ordered a monofilm lip tester. A bunch of little things to clean out your ears. I do. Yeah. Well, I think it's not unreasonable. Usually you use these for like diabetics, right? you to point to where I am poking, okay? Okay. Okay. Sweet. Excellent. And here? And here? And here? And here? Nice. Okay. No, um, a physical exam should take less than five minutes for a complete physical exam. Especially if you've got other people waiting. You and I are just chatting it up, Henrik, because you are my priority today. That's what's up. I give my my folks, like my telehealth folks that I see, I have a couple of folks I see every single week. My special folks. 
every single week without fail. Um, and then I have a couple I see like once a month, but they still are supposed to check in with me every week. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, there is an additional test that we can do. I do think, based on what you've said, you do meet criteria for long COVID. Um, I don't think we want to diagnose you with anything else yet. Yeah, we can talk about things like chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia and other stuff in the future. Um, that's something I really want you to not have <laughs> because it sucks. It's and it doesn't. It has a couple treatments that are kind of helpful. I remember in residency, um, one of my fellow residents was like, but you're on Lyrica now, so you should be better. But it's not how it works. It mitigates it, doesn't fix it. Without my Lyrica, and without the um, milnazapran that I'm on, well then I'm flat on my back the whole day. Because I'm too weak. But even with them, I hurt. I hurt a lot. <laughs> so that's not something I want you to have, right? That is not ideal. <laughs> well, since you mentioned a little bit of scalp tension, I have, there's a technique called OMT, Osteopathic Manipulation Therapy, um, which I was trained in, even though I'm not a DO, I'm an MD. Um, and I can do a little bit on your scalp. It's basically like moving around the skin and the fascia um, to kind of put it back where it's supposed to go. Because <laughs> it can get like fascia, the fascia is the layer under the skin um, and under and before the muscle. It's this like white shiny stuff and it, if you look at it microscopically it's actually a bunch of like thin fibers. It's almost like a liquid but not. And when those fibers are tangled and stuff, that's where people get, like, that's where people get a lot of times pain that can feel a little bit better with things like, you know, sometimes it feels a little better when you rub on that spot, right? It's like for temporary pain. Uh, sometimes it can help relieve chronic pain for a little bit. Not gonna treat it, right? Uh, but relief is relief, man. So, it's kind of like if massage and chiropractic had a baby. But we're more clinically valued, validated with randomized control trials. OMT is a little bit more um, kind of scientific. <laughs> I do work with massage therapists, actually. Um, in fact, I have one who I'm trying to bring to Paraguay with me to do some uh, massage on like traumatized and impoverished women. Specifically because a lot of times that human touch can be really relieving for mental health purposes. Um, there's not good data on like massage fixing things long term, she'll even say that. But there is good data for massage helping, um, well, everybody has experience with massage helping at least temporarily, right? To feel a little better. And that bit of relief, that bit of connection, emotionally that can mean a lot to show that kind of love um, and compassion to somebody who has only experienced negative touch. Or a lot of betrayal touch, right? Yeah. Sorry, shaking my head made me dizzy. I have a lot of dizziness too. That's another thing with the fibromyalgia. So, I actually wanted to try something together. Back pain wise. I was sent this butterfly shaped lumbar cushion. I asked them, um, says, let all people in the world sleep better. <laughs> I asked them if they, um, you know, if the manufacturing is humane and stuff like that. And they said where it was. It's like in Shenzhou. And they said it is, but that's not, I can't confirm anything. But I try to ask when companies send me things. Um, they didn't send me any money or anything, but they sent me this to kind of check out. So, I think since we are having... A little bit of back pain, we can try this out. 
up and see how it feels. See if it's a little cushiony. And if it's good, if I like it, maybe I'll give it to you. Oh yeah. Of course they asked me to put links and stuff like that. So, there is that. Let's kind of open it and see what's I'm going to take my gloves off. Oh yeah, I was offering to do own tea. Um, if you want, that's something we can do. You want to look at the cushion first? Okay, let's do that. I love giving you gifts. So the correct way to take a glove off, you don't want to touch the inside at all. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always like the most embarrassing thing, like for medical students and stuff, when you're bad at gloves. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> because sometimes your hands get a little bit sticky. So the simple way is you stick your finger underneath here so that you don't touch the outside because once, especially for like surgeries and stuff, you can't touch the outside. And then you roll it up. And that's basically how you do it. And it's very simple that way. Yes, actually. Yeah. Yeah, no, my fingers are super stuck today, but that's okay. Just turn the glove inside out and there we go. Let's take a look at this. Very well packaged, oh my goodness. Oh, I am pleasantly surprised by this. Sometimes people send me things that are not very high quality. Oh, and I guess you fasten it to yourself. Let's look at the directions. It says, the main body of the pillow is designed wider and larger, which could fully support your waist and back. The height of the small band cushion can be freely adjusted by yourself. The combination of soft and hard parts can support your back, waist and back very well. The main body of the lumbar pillow is very soft and can make your waist and back comfortable. The small band cushion is relatively hard, but you provide strong support. I'm actually really pleased with how solid it is. I like solid construction of things. The straps are a little weird. I don't I don't quite understand how these straps work. But I guess they are for keeping the pillow where it's supposed to go. Oh it, it can even unzip. You can hide stuff in there. Like your social security card. Obviously, I'm kidding, yes. The back also has a zipper, too. That's nice, because that means you can clean it. It's pretty solid. I wonder what's inside. I wonder what's inside. Oh, even that's nice. I thought it was just going to be like some dumb foam. That's very nice. Oh, sweet. I am pleased with the make of this thing. I am confused, though, as to how to fasten the... And I guess this thing goes around the chair. But this I don't understand. I don't understand the small round pillow. I guess you just kind of put it behind you and... Hope, which way is up? Oh, it's like this. That's why the small round pillow doesn't need to be fastened. Because it hangs. It hangs down like that. Well, I'm going to try it first. I'm going to take this white coat off now. Well, I might, yeah, I don't get in trouble with the, the front desk ladies are very bossy. Yes, I have bad experiences with nurses and front desk ladies often. I have some very good ones. I have an amazing one who's coming with me on one of the shorter trips. Um, so I, I kind of live in Paraguay, a significant portion of the year now. And then I, uh, I'm here. And I'll be here for, like, November to February. Yeah. I do like this. I do like this. 
I don't love the small round pillow, but I think the reason is I can adjust where it is to match my back skirt. Which is kind of cool. Or I can get rid of it. What else if I get rid of it altogether? I kind of like it without the small round pillow. I have the small round pillow tucked up, so there's a little more support up higher. I like that better. Because with the fibromyalgia, the small round pillow kind of digs into my back a little bit. Yeah. I like this thing. <laughs> I dig this thing. I am going to put an affiliate link for you. And, uh, that'll help support. <laughs> yeah, so I am fundraising for Paraguay. For medicines and things like that. So, all that kind of stuff helps to support that. I'm actually working on changing both the tea store and setting up some different 501c3 stuff. So that I can have basically a separate thing where 100% of everything goes to, right now 100% of tea profits are going or Liberia, where my friend's orphanage is. Um, and what else? Yeah. So, affiliate stuff. You can take care of yourself. My, my business motto in the United States is essentially, well, there's two. One is taking care of yourself so you can take care of others. So basically, I take your money that you use to take care of yourself, and then I give it to people who don't have it. <laughs> I am a consensual Robin Hood. Um, and then in, um, the other one is creating, well, taking care of yourself to take care of others is part of the, like, becoming a real life superhero ethos. Why don't you try this? Let's have you put this behind you. Doesn't that feel nice? Yeah, you can take it home if you want. Yeah. No, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. I might just order another one for myself. I like it. I, I don't know how much they cost, but I'm going to put an affiliate link and uh, I might celebrate them again. I like this thing. Sometimes people send me things that I'm not like super crazy about. I was sent, I sent this, which I think is really neat. It's an artificial lavender essential diffuser. I thought it was cool. But it wasn't the kind of thing that I was like super in love with because um, as a physician, like essential oil diffusers, like, the evidence, so sure, aromatherapy, calm you down, nice. But the evidence for most of these things is in ingestion. Like lavender, the evidence is in eating it, not putting it on your feet or smelling it or whatever. The, the studies I could find anyway were if you ingest it. Yeah. Which is why I have lavender in my tea store. You, you put it in you, and that's how it gets better. So, as a physician, I don't really support a lot of things in the essential oil business. Which is why I don't show this a lot. But, I did, I think it was a beautiful thing, like a beautiful little luxury thing. So that's kind of neat. But just, you know. And obviously, I can't make any real recommendations to you. Um, so it's kind of cool. I like this pot. I wanted to give this to my mother. Hey, Henrik, right now we're just shooting the shit. You're good, unless you got somewhere to be. Yeah. No, you're not wasting my time, don't worry. So, it looks kind of neat. And then it's got the little diffuser thing that goes underneath it. This thing. So, it's kind of neat. Someone sent me something that I thought was super cool, which was a, um, a carbon monoxide detector. But then it didn't work. I demonstrated it on camera linked to other brands in the description because carbon monoxide is so, like it's important, it's good to have a carbon monoxide detector, but the one they sent me didn't work. So these things are okay. I like them. I stand by them. Sometimes people try to send me things that are like, can you be a spokesperson for um, testosterone supplements? And I'm like, no, because I'm super against that. <laughs> Or sometimes I'll respond with like a snide little, sure, send me a randomized controlled clinical trial demonstrating the efficacy of your supplement. And we'll go from there. Obviously, a review is a little strong. Like, for just getting into a science, it's like a, an area, it's good to look at a meta analysis. That's many, many studies put together. Um, 
And then after that, it's good to look at reviews because they can put together some stuff and analyze some stuff. But then you're dealing with the opinion of the person who's synthesizing and including or not including those studies. And then the study itself, that's like the actual science being done. But it has to be replicable. So you have to see many studies, ideally, on one thing. Oh, like, I was prescribing somebody, I was looking into an SGLT2 inhibitor for somebody's diabetes this week. Um, and when I was just double checking things with that medication, I found four or five studies confirming its use, right? It's, it's benefit. So that was important. One of them was by the company that obviously the company that is making it has to do a study because otherwise what are they doing um, but you want to have those studies replicated by other people and these were and so I prescribed this medication yes but just because something is approved by the FDA doesn't mean that I know it's best to use right which is why I'll still research everything I'm also very insecure and it is so, so important to me to make sure nothing happens to anybody because of stuff that caused the PTSD. <laughs> um, it wasn't stuff that I did, it was stuff that I felt other people weren't letting me do and I felt locked from being able to save people. I, I was even told, like, for one baby, like, Jen, you're not gonna save this baby. And I wanted nothing more. And, and he was, the, the thing was saying that to be realistic. Um, I would have gladly died in order for that baby to survive, really. It was... <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm still gonna cry now. <laughs> but... Um, nah. I, I say I'm over it because I've had therapy, but... <laughs> I'm crying. I'm sure that's not what you signed up for, Henry. Yeah, this is a carbon monoxide alarm somebody sent me, but it doesn't work. They were positively reviewed online, but I'm wondering if that's because... I'm wondering if it was a... I wonder if this was a counterfeit, to tell you the truth. Anyway, it did work, and I wrote to them and said, Hey, I did it in a video, but it doesn't work, and if you'd like to send me a new one, I can, because this one doesn't work, so that doesn't look good for you. And so, that is the result. I didn't just link to them, I linked it to everybody else, because I want people to buy carbon monoxide filters, but I want people to buy ones that work. <laughs> That's important. Alright, any questions for me? I think for now... Yeah, I can actually show you some stuff on... Um, so long COVID treatment is mostly symptomatic. Yeah. No, so can I give you a trick for looking things up online? Um, so that you don't, uh, look up stupid things. Yeah. Some people think long COVID is like a brain injury. There's all kinds of different Um, so a good way to look things up online is you Google it with Medscape, because Medscape is the resource that's for doctors, and uh, that's kind of a big deal. Or you can look up the CDC guidelines, um, and not everything the CDC says is good, but they do do their best, because there's some politics with HHS and CDC. So it does occur more often in people who had severe illness. And I forgot, I shouldn't say the word. I should not say the word because I'm going to get that dumb little flag underneath. <sighs> Apparently they're saying people who are not vaccinated and got infected have a higher risk of developing it compared to people who have been vaccinated when they get the infection. So, but anyone who has the virus can Yeah, you have the, uh, you have the symptoms. Yeah. 
What's not great is sometimes they're patient-facing. The CDC has patient-facing information that's not that great. Um, and so that's not very great. <sighs> so anytime you're on, you look on, you look for like CDC information for healthcare providers. And then they'll like link to studies and stuff because they treat the general public like you're dumb. And they don't give you study links and they don't give you evidence. Um, and that sucks because you need that to be able to evaluate what's true. Because they might be saying things like, HHS right now is supporting some health procedures that are really dangerous and that I've seen firsthand ruin women's lives. Um, and that can be avoided. <laughs> or that can be treated a different and safer way. Um, and I know that because I've looked at the studies. I have a two-page paper of like 20 different studies that everyone seems to be ignoring. And that's because there's a lot of politics and money in that. So people have to prove themselves to you. Don't just trust them. So one way to check things online, don't go to WebMD. Don't go to patient-facing things. Healthline is pretty good because Healthline will cite their sources for you even though you're a patient. So I like them because you can check what they're saying. They're, they're very, very good. I actually want to write for them because they rock. Um, mm -hmm. Make a doctor account on Medscape so you can see the doctor stuff. Yeah. I have a patient who I had her do that. Works fine. It's not fraud or anything. Who knows what you're a doctor of? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, myalgic encephal encephalomyelitis. Is basically, yep. So, vitamin deficiencies sometimes are things. So I'm gonna review some labs, okay? And you can look this up. Yep. The CDC is not very helpful for that. It's all like symptom-based care. So really people just have to do what, you know, what I would be doing anyway for somebody who has a chronic pain situation. So what we can try, I would like you to follow up with me about that, actually. Because there are some antidepressants that uh, also have anti-pain benefit. Mm -hmm. Can I have you fill out a PHQ-9 and send it to me this week? So, for now, I would put on a lot of, like, icy hot tiger balm. You can try capsaicin cream. That sometimes helps for those kind of things. Um, it helps for a, a disease called CRPS, which is kind of similar. It's like where your body decides to react for a long time after an illness for apparently no reason. Yeah. So, um, I can order you some lidocaine patches, but... If you have pain on your whole body, that's not super helpful, mostly back stuff. So, um, yoga and Tai Chi, Tai Chi especially, is very helpful for those kind of conditions because you're kind of stretching out that uncomfortable fascia. Yeah. For fatigue, decrease your meat intake, decrease your carbs intake, like simple carbs like bread, increase your dark colored vegetable intakes. Yeah, so like kale and dark fruits like blueberries. Mm -hmm. That can help. I did a whole video on blueberries and I think another one on white lentils, um, stuff like that. Yeah. Okay then. Yeah. So I'll order you those things. I would avoid taking a lot of Tylenol and NSAIDs. I would take turmeric instead. There are actually a couple neat studies and you can go to pubmed.gov. That's where you can fact check the things I say. Um, sometimes I'll link to studies, sometimes I'll just, I'll give you the full title of the study, but if I don't, pubmin.gov is where I usually find studies that I need to look at. You can find extra things on ScienceDirect, too, but PubMed is more organized, and it's good. 
Yeah. Absolutely. So we'll try those things, okay? Alright. Lots of, like, hot or cold that makes you feel good. <laughs> mm-hmm. Managing chronic fatigue sucks, and diet and exercise, like with a lot of things, are actually important. Figuring out the kind of exercise that doesn't wear you out, but that gives you enough endorphins to help you go. Yeah. And then there's a big psychological portion to fatigue. I'm not saying that you're making it up in your head. I'm saying surviving it requires a sometimes some rewiring. Okay, so we'll start with those things. So I'm going to order these labs, and then we'll follow up in a couple months, okay? We can do it sooner, we can do it next month. Yeah. I want to follow up on the depression thing privately sooner than that, okay? 